everybody. Glad to see everybody here for this session. We've had a riveting morning and early afternoon discussing climate and health. And we're going to replicate that here for you this afternoon and leave enough time for questions. As you know, this is part of a series that we've run. Many of you have come in the times before. We see the world at a kind of hinge in history. And there are great changes taking place in many directions, in demography, in technology, in the problems of governance, and in the climate and health. So we're discussing all of these things, and we hope that by the time we get through to have covered a lot of bases and to be able to construct what might be done about all these things. Coming up on April 22nd, we have a discussion of the Middle East. And on May 5th, emerging technologies and the US economy. And on May 14th, uh, one on governance. So these are things that are coming up. Now, today we have a panel of four. And the um, conveners, the people who will lead the discussion, this is the time when we have two people, because one, each one has to introduce the other. So <clears throat> um, we have Lucy Shapiro and Steve. And if I, I think, Steve, I turn it over to you first, and then you will introduce the panel and get us started. And then when you get ready to speak, Lucy will introduce you. OK? Take it away. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'm happy to introduce my co-moderator here, Lucy Shapiro, who uh, is a longtime professor of developmental biology here at Stanford, uh, 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 someone with very, very broad interests who's worked on basic science and uh, applications to human health, uh, won many, many awards recognizing her work, very prominently also the National Medal of Science, and uh, is a wonderful colleague. Um, <clears throat> Should I do the whole group here? Sure. Yes. OK. Milana, you'll have to help me with your last yeah. name. Yeah, my name is Milana bookman Trounce, and I'm an emergency room physician here at Stanford. And I teach a class on biosecurity and uh, emerging infectious disease. And Kari Nadeau at the end, who's the uh, 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 Mercy Professor of, uh, of Pediatrics and Allergy Research, runs the Sean Parker Allergy Clinic here at Stanford. Well, since we're making introductions, my colleague to my left, uh, is a stupendous scientist. Name is Steve Quake. He's the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and a professor of bioengineering and applied physics here at Stanford. Okay, thank you. Okay. So shall we do the same order as this sure, morning? Sure, sure. Okay. okay. So the same order as we did this morning means it's me. <laughs> so I'll start off and I'll be quite brief so we can save all our time for Q&A with you. And what we were discussing today is fundamentally three things. The fact that there is a rapid change in the Earth's ecosystem, whether you call it global warming or climate change, the world as we know it, its ecosystem is out of whack. And a consequence of that is climate change. We're going to talk about the consequences of these changes and the technologies at our disposal to mitigate the consequences of these changes. Now, at the onset, let me just reiterate that this is not the first major disruption in the Earth's climate. This has happened several times over the four billion years of the existence of our planet. What is happening now is fundamentally different in two ways. Number one, the change is in large part man-made, woman-made. And second, it's the rate of change. So 250, years, 250 million years ago in the Permian ice, uh, in the Permian warming changes, we lost a vast amount of living creatures on this globe. And there was warming, warming of the oceans, loss of all of the uh, reefs around the world, 
loss of all the critters that we know. And it took 10 million years to come back to life on Earth as we ultimately know it. The changes that we are going through now are, it took a thousand years back then to go through the warming period. What they did in a thousand years, we've now done in 10. If not, if you get a broad view, 100. We do not have 100 million years ahead of us to fix this all up. And so global weather patterns, not just warming, is what we're faced with. And you can have severe droughts and heating in one part of our globe, and at the same time, extraordinarily cold temperatures, snow and floods in another. It's the imbalance. It's the fact that the entire ecosystem is skewed. So given that, what are the consequences? And people always like to say, well, we predict this and we predict that, and it's based on models. I'm not talking about that. What I'm telling you about is what has happened today, what we are facing right now. What are these things? We're facing the accelerated rise in global sea levels right now. Cataclysmic wildfires and extreme flooding, disruptive storm patterns, acidification and warming of the oceans that has led to the death of a major portion of the coral reefs that encircle this globe. The consequent disruptions in marine food chain are enormous. Four, and this is what we really have focused on, is the global redistribution of bacterial, fungin, fungal, and viral pathogens, and most importantly, their vectors, the rats, mice, mosquitoes, ticks that carry these pathogens, have now migrated from the tropics up into the temperate zones because the weather patterns have changed. And so now we're finding things like Zika, chikungunya, dengue, West Nile virus, a whole panoply of pathogens at places where they have not been seen before, right here in the continental United States and in Europe, as well as brand new pathogens that have come out of deforested land and places where they were thriving once but can now thrive right here. So given that, uh, what are the new technologies that we have going for us to be able to diagnose, treat, identify, and do away with the vectors that are carrying these diseases? So while the Earth has been changing so dramatically, there's been a revolution in genomics. And this revolution in genomics has allowed us to do gene editing. We can change genes in every living organism. And one of the most interesting applications of gene editing is something called carrying out gene drives. What is that? A gene drive is a way to, let's say, deal with a vector like a mosquito that's carrying malaria. And you want to get rid of that mosquito. How do you do it? So there are two methods. One is called population modification drive where you're making a vector that's unable to serve as a reservoir for that particular pathogen or virus, so it can't be transmitted from the mosquito to us. So the mosquito goes on living, but it can't transmit the virus. The other is called a suppression drive, and in that one, you're eliminating the ability of the vector to propagate potentially wiping out a species. And I'm telling you this because it's pretty critical right now that we make decisions about this because these gene drives have been designed. The biology exists. They've been proven. You're able to do this. And I'll give you an example as a malaria test case, which is a population gene drive. In malaria, 200 million people in 2015 were infected worldwide. 2016, 
216 million and rising now. 700,000 people died and 72% of them were children under five years old. Of the 3,500 mosquito species, only one subset of Anopheles, one of the mosquitoes, can transmit the malarial parasite. So what people did, what scientists did, were modify, they modified that particular species of mosquito so that it could no longer carry the parasite that causes malaria. And it was shown under laboratory conditions that this population modification drive led to the disappearance of the normal mosquito while it gene edited the rest of them and they thrived. If this was released into areas endemic with malaria, it could potentially halt the spread and save millions of lives. But if you think about it for a moment, what are we doing? We're releasing a new organism that we have tampered with. We've changed its genetic material. And we need wise heads to, de to decide where does it get released? Should it be released? And we have made many, many different kinds of gene drives, all of which are potentially life-saving then you're tampering with a species. Some of these, you can get rid of a species. There are 3,500 species of mosquitoes. Do we need them all? Who can make this decision? So I put this out to you as a challenge of stuff that we have to think about and to let you know that climate change is not a figment of somebody's imagination. It's real. Uh, and what we have to do is deal with the consequences that are facing us today. I'll stop there. Thank you, Lucy. So I think we'll go through all of the speakers and then have an open question session discussion in the end. So, Kari. Thank you, and I really appreci appreciate being uh, invited to speak here as uh, Mr. I, there we go. I really uh, am honored to speak here, and uh, I very much appreciate uh, being invited by uh, Dr. Quake and Dr. Shapiro, as well as uh, Secretary Schultz and Mr. Trimble. So I'll talk a little bit about the problem and public health and what's happening on the individual health level with climate change, and then I'll also give you some examples of hope and promise. Because I think today, importantly, with my other colleagues, so we all respect each other's research, but we also want to make sure that whatever we talk about today, that we give you the facts, that we're going to give you the news in a real way based on science, based on data. And importantly, how are we going to deal with those facts and how are we going to make sure that we can have an impact for the future in a real, tangible, policy-oriented way. And we are so grateful for you to be part of this discussion because as uh, Dr. Shapiro said, we'd really like to make sure that we get and engage your uh, questions and have a dialogue in the end. So quickly, the problem. I think all of you um, were here probably during the Paradise Fire, yes? Okay. So I'll give you some examples of wildfire. Uh, but importantly, we know that climate change is a reality. We know that it's real, despite setbacks and policies and possibly some statements made by government officials recently. We know that climate change is coming. It's already here. And we know that the rapid rise in temperature is mostly due to carbon dioxide emissions. And those carbon dioxide emissions are, in the majority of the cases, due to fossil fuels and partially combusted diesel exhaust. And where does that diesel exhaust come from? Well, a lot of it is man-made. So you have this rise in carbon dioxide. You have this increase in temperature change. That's affecting our planet. It's affecting our health. So how is that? Well, first, let's talk about the different types of pollution, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution. So with air pollution, when diesel exhaust gets combusted, that comes into our lungs, is specifically as something we call in science particulate matter. Less than 2.5 microns, really small. That's basically 1 25th. If you split your human hair 25 times, that's how small these particles are. You're not going to see them. 
but unfortunately they get into your lung. They cause all sorts of inflammation. They cause mucus production. For those of you who were here during the wildfires, we were exposed to the equiv equivalent of up to seven cigarettes a day, as if we were smoking them. That's the amount of PM2.5 that was getting into our lungs during that sort of five to 10 days of high amounts of air quality indices. When you see that air quality index, which I'm sure you all looked up and Googled when you were all here in the Paradise Fire, that's equivalent to PM2.5. It's a level of PM2.5 that you're exposed to. So we know that that is dangerous for us. We know that it's particularly dangerous for people that are over 65. There were studies done during the Napa Valley fires and so people that were exposed even to five days of the wildfire, which it's going to unfortunately become the new norm here in California. It's going to increase heart attacks possibly by about 30 to 50 percent in greater than 65 years of age. In addition, for children less than four years of age, asthma rates are going to probably increase. That's also been published in the literature. So we know that asthma, COPD, heart attacks, strokes, all increase during acute settings of wildfire exposure, which is, for our purposes, sort of the worst case of air pollution that we're exposed to. But there's a part of California, for example, the Central Valley, where we have, unfortunately, the top 10 cities in the country here in California have the highest amounts of air pollution, and they all sit in the Central Valley. And that's due to a lot of different causes, but the people in the Central Valley, for example, have the highest rates of asthma. That's been lowered because of some mitigating circumstances that have changed policy for the Clean Air Act, thank goodness. But in addition, in the Central Valley, there's the highest rate of allergies, 70% of the population compared to 30% of the population here in the Bay Area. And so these chronic and acute diseases are going to continue. We need to understand why they're continuing in certain people rather than others. We need to understand differences in socioeconomic strata as well as age. This research is continuing, but it's here now. Climate change is affecting people's health. If it hasn't already affected your health, if you already felt that during the wildfires you had mucus and congestion and itchy eyes, it possibly will in the future. But importantly is we can do something about that now. When you think about water pollution, that's another major issue that's affecting people's health. With the decrease in ice and the increase in melting, we're going to see flooding. With flooding, we're going to see people's health being affected. We're seeing mercury and lead rising already, the heavy metals. Whenever you, there's coal burning, when there's diesel exhaust that's burned, you already have seen it in the fish supply, but heavy metals get emitted into the air and then also go into the water. So you see this increase in heavy metals in the water. That's also going to affect people's health. Lead obviously affects cognition. Mercury affects cognition. So these heavy metals are now part of, unfortunately, the water supply, and they are polluting the water, but they're also affecting people's health. Soil is another major issue. In California, we're also growing a lot of amazing fruits and vegetables. But if you go to Salinas, for example, the amount of methyl bromide that's being used in the strawberries there is seeping into the soil. And the children and the adults that are taking care of that soil to give us what we buy at the supermarket, i.e. The, the people that are working in the fields, they're, they have been tested with their IQ. And unfortunately, because of those pesticides, their IQs are less than the equivalent in the Bay Area where people are not uh, being exposed to those types of pesticides. So we know that soil contamination is a major issue. But we also know that as we deplete the resources in our soil, there's food security issues. And the average vegetable that we would have bought at the market 10 years ago has about 50% less zinc, for example, or iron in it today. So we have to think about how these different types of pollution scenarios are affecting people's health in the long run as well as nutrition. So I've given you some examples. Let me give you some hope and promise because we need that. And we need to make sure that we lock elbows with each other and help in designing changes both on the individual, on the local, as well as the global level. So let's talk about some global level examples of things that really worked. So in 1987, the Montreal Protocol, which Secretary Schultz was involved with, there was a big issue with chlorofluorocarbons affecting the ozone around the Antarctic layer. And we knew that that was very bad for health. There were a lot of papers that had come out of 
chlorofluorocarbons being bad for people's health. And so the Montreal Protocol got together and made a difference. So now after banning C chlorofluorocarbons, now that ozone hole has been decreased. And so that's fantastic news. There's more and more examples of that. For example, when a local area stops pollution, for example, Atlanta for the Olympic Games, Beijing for the Olympic Games, you actually saw a decline in asthma rates. So it is possible to make these changes. On the individual level, we're seeing a lot of great things happening where we can do more exposome uh, assessments. We can try to modify our carbon footprint, for example. But importantly, all of this has to come from us as individuals. And we can also be a part of policy changes that we need to be able to effectively talk to our legislative bodies and hopefully push legislation like the Clean Air Act that since the 1970s has improved people's health here in the US, but other developing countries also need to start to implement the same types of policy changes. And I'll stop there. I'm very excited about the future. I'm very happy to be here. But importantly, it's going to take a lot of people doing research. There are a lot of people outside of the four of us that are doing research here on global climate change. We have Dr. Auerbach in the audience who did work in the emergency room and wildfires and is helping mitigate those types of uh, global warming effects. We have other people at the Woods Institute, the Lane Center for the West. You have here in the Hoover Institute. These types of dialogues are going on on the Stanford campus and research needs to happen so that we can get some answers in terms of how well do air filters work, how well do masks work, for example. So we're very grateful uh, for the chance at Stanford to do this type of research so that we can get it out to the public and make an impact. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our next speaker is Milana Trounce, who is an emergency room physician and an associate professor in medicine. Milana. Um, so first off, thank you very much for your leadership, uh, Secretary Schultz, Dr. Timby, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Quake, for bringing all of us together to talk about these important existential issues. I will speak about the issue of pandemics and on how that is applicable and that relates to climate change. Um, to give you a bit of background, infectious disease is not new. Uh, in fact, it has shaped human evolution. And people historically have died from uh, two causes, violence, including war, and infectious disease. Guess, when, guess which one is more common? infectious disease by about 20 times, being about 20 times more common than violence. So that just to give you a bit of a backdrop. Um, then going a little bit further in history, by the mid 20th century, we thought we've conquered infectious disease with the advent of antibiotics, advent of the vaccines, in enhancement in hygiene. Infectious disease became a lot less interesting. It's back. Since 1980s, we've seen about a three-fold increase in the number of epidemics caused by uh, emerging infectious disease. Um, and this is, uh, and we're also seeing an increase in the type um, of uh, outbreaks that we see. A lot of that is driven very much by climate change. As Dr. Shapiro has al already alluded to, um, mosquitoes uh, travel, and uh, we're seeing um, outbreaks in places where we've never seen them before. Furthermore, we're also seeing a rise in emerging infectious diseases. Uh, a lot of that also secondary to climate change as uh, people come more in contact with wild populations. Most in emerging infections are actually zoonotic. They come from animals. So as we're seeing that increase uh, happen, a lot of uh, due to climate change, we're seeing more outbreaks. Climate change is not the only driver of emerging infectious disease and, of, and the rise in pandemics, but it's only one of the driving factor and it compounds the others as well. Uh, advances in technology, including uh, things like bioengineering and techniques like CRISPR-Cas9, now we can modify infectious diseases to be more deadly. I'll give you the example of smallpox which was actually one of the biggest wins for the public health. Smallpox was eradicated in 1980s. We now have a vaccine for everybody in the US um, against smallpox, should it ever come back. Uh, that was primarily used as a bioweapon. However, just last year, 
a group of uh, scientists in Canada uh, synthesized horsepox virus, which is a, is a close relative of smallpox, illustrating that smallpox could actually be brought back. All right? Furthermore, uh, and another group of scientists that was back in 2001 have uh, modified mouse pox virus, which is a benign uh, pox virus infecting mice and other rodents, by inserting the IL-4 gene in it, making um, this virus 100% lethal in mice, and even 50% lethal even in the mice that are immunized. So how truly protected are we? Um, also, the, given the fact that um, people travel now with globalization and other factors, urbanization, that completely changes in how infectious diseases spread. Urbanization puts unprecedented demands on the infrastructure um, of cities. In fact, 180,000 people are moving to cities a day. Um, a lot of them live in tight quarters. Um, so this makes it much more conducive uh, to the spread of epidemics. And it's much harder to control epidemics in these kinds of environments. Um, additionally, um, how do we deal with it? So now, we're, this is a problem in our hands, and we're seeing things like Ebola happen. Why did Ebola happen the way it did? Ebola is, by the way, is not a new virus. Uh, we've uh, discovered it in 1976, and there's been about 20 Ebola outbreaks about which we've never heard about. Why? They've only involved ten, tens of people to a few hundred people. They've all occurred in remote villages in Africa. And what happens is um, there's an outbreak. A significant por portion of the member of the um, people living in that village die, and it never spreads, and then we never hear about it. What happened in 2014? 30,000 people infected with Ebola, over 10,000 dead. Global travel. And this is an example of a pattern which will only continue because we're no longer in an isolated world. We're in increasingly a global village. So how do we deal with that? Well, how about one might say, why don't we just have a vaccine or a drug for everything that's out there? Let's see if that's realistic. Now we have a lot of technologies. We can come up with vaccines and drugs. It costs about $2.5 billion to, for the drug to reach market. There, is, there are thousands of viruses and bacteria capable of causing pandemics, and each of them can, be, uh, can either mutate or be genetically modified in infinite number of ways. We will click quickly run out of our entire GDP before we have a vaccine or a drug for every um, uh, agent. Okay, how about if the, we're not gonna have drugs, or, and by the way, I'm not discounting drugs or vaccines, they're incredibly useful, but they're just not um, as useful for brand new, novel, emerging infectious disease. So how about um, we rely on supportive treatment? Um, hospitals are a wonderful thing. We can keep you alive. We can try to help you with breathing. We can resuscitate you. We can do a lot of things to try to keep you alive while your own immune system fights um, an infection. And um, there is definitely a significant increase uh, in survival with these, uh, just with supportive measures alone, even without the specific drugs. Okay, well, let's look at our surge capacity in the hospitals. I'm not sure um, if uh, any of you had a chance to visit the, our emergency room last year or in, uh, sometime prior, years prior. We break out a tent uh, to accommodate our um, yearly surge in flu. And this is a yearly, completely predictable surge that we experience. And I can tell you that with a serious pandemic, if uh, uh, this number uh, increases uh, significantly, we're just not going to have enough space in our hospital to uh, provide care for everybody who needs it. And this is not just applicable to Stanford. This is a condition all across the country. Emergency room overcrowding is a well-known, well-documented problem. And unfortunately, um, a lot of that goes back to finances. It's expensive uh, to keep um, hospital beds open and staffed. Uh, hospitals, or like any business, they're trying to uh, run a lean operation. So we're not going to have, we're not going to be able to rely on drugs or vaccines in an event of an emerging brand new pandemic. We're not going to have surge capacity to deal with it. What do we do? 
we do what we have done for centuries. We rely on public health control measures to uh, um, essentially get ahead of the epidemics. I'll give you one quick example, SARS. A patient with SARS traveled to Canada, to Vancouver, and then another patient with SARS traveled to Toronto. No uh, outbreak in Vancouver. In Toronto, 300 people infected, 44 dead. Half of them are healthcare workers. Why? Because in the patient that got to Vancouver was immediately isolated, and that isolation was uh, delayed in Toronto. This is just one example. Um, I think the biggest promise um, will be at innovation around interruption of transmission when it comes to novel infectious organisms. How might this look like? I can tell you that if there is a deadly outbreak right now in the world, in Palo Alto, in the world, anywhere, if we can all just stay home for a month, we're done. We are done. How do we make that happen? Could we use technology to enable that? Could we use things like telecommuting, uh, shopping online? Um, how do we empower people to self-quarantine in their homes, if you will? How do we empower organizations to self-quarantine? Um, could we use drones uh, or um, automate, some kind of automated um, vehicles to deliver people critical supplies like food and water, medications? Um, what else can we do? Could we use UV lights to dis disinfect? There's been some, a number of interesting studies done which have shown that increasing humidity and temperature um, actually can significantly decrease the transmission of the influenza viral particles. Um, how about touchless bathrooms, touchless everything to decrease the spread of uh, with fomites? And of course, the public health control measures um, which are behavioral and social in nature also cannot be uh, underestimated. Um, this is uh, an example that we can go uh, back to the Spanish flu pandemic. Spanish flu pandemic um, happened about 100 years ago. Last year was the 100th um, anniversary. How did cities deal with that in the absence of vaccines or drugs? They dealt with it with public health, uh, restriction of large, large gatherings, improved hygiene, closing of schools, Basically, how do we uh, essentially stop uh, or interrupt uh, the transmission of infectious disease? And I would like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One, people think it's all political. Another, another camp thinks it's um, all, it has everything to do with technology and science. And I think the answer is somewhere in between. I think it will take all of us coming together, the business people, the uh, people, the scientists, the doctors, the policymakers, in order to um, make us uh, survive the pandemics and make our society resilient to pandemic threats. Thank you. So, our final speaker, Professor Quick. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I'll just share a few thoughts on what the role of new technologies might be in addressing the challenges to human health that are going to result from climate change. Um, and I'll focus primarily on uh, the technology of genomics, or DNA sequencing, which has undergone a real revolution in the last decade. Uh, the cost of sequencing genomes has gone down by orders of magnitude. The ability to throughput the speed has gone up by orders of magnitude. It's just been nothing short of remarkable, and it's really changed the way we think about biology and medicine. Um, these tools are useful not just for sequencing genomes, but also for sequencing the contents of cells. You can look at the messages inside cells that are, that are uh, sort of uh, creating the identity of, of these cells, and there's a ton of biology to learn from that, and also many wonderful things to discover. Um, so as a first example, uh, I'll talk about uh, the question of dengue, and this is a very specific project we've been working on at the Biohub with, and Stanford. Um, so dengue is a, is a tropical, it's been viewed as a tropical disease, but with climate change it's going to uh, become an important uh, uh, challenge here in the United States. Right now there's something like 400 million people a year infected with it, 100 countries. Uh, it's just kind of breached the United States and as temperatures go up it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem in the U.S. It's carried by mosquitoes um, and so they're following the temperature up. 
There's no cure. There's no vaccine. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, has, has uh, been challenging to treat. Even diagnosis can be challenging. Um, <clears throat> and so what our research program has been involved with has been uh, recruiting people who have been infected with dengue um, just as they're fighting the infection and their bodies are mounting a response. And some of these people are able to respond. Uh, their immune systems create antibodies against the virus and they recover quickly. Um, we've used genomics and sequencing to analyze the immune cells of those individuals. Uh, and in some of them, we found, uh, we've discovered that the antibodies they make are, uh, are incredibly useful in the sense that they can bind to all the four strains of dengue uh, with strong affinity and can neutralize them all. And the ability to have discovered and cloned and manipulate those antibodies means that we might be able to use them as a therapeutic or a vaccine one day. So we're at the sort of beginning of the story where we found the antibodies, we know what they can do. Uh, over the next several years, we'll try to prove that they can have uh, some medical uses, um, but it all kind of derived from this genomics technology and the ability to analyze the individual cells of the immune system of these individuals. And this is something that can be done with virtually any infectious disease and is a very general way to approach the development of new uh, vaccines and therapeutics and one that's become uh, very cost effective in recent years thanks to the work of many in, in the industry of, of, of biologic therapeutics. So that's one example uh, that has to do with the therapeutic and the vaccine side. Another example, which has to do with the diagnostic side, uh, is the ability of sequencers to read out uh, the DNA and RNA that are present in any sample um, without any assumptions about what's there. So you can uh, take a sample of blood or spit from somebody who's sick, sequence the DNA and RNA that's there, and discover what's making them sick. Um, without having to guess, was it a bacteria, was it a virus, was it a fungus? You don't have to do a specific test. You can invent a test that is hypothesis-free and tests for all infectious disease at the same time. Um, and that's a very sort of clarifying approach and one that will be useful both for individual diagnostics and for understanding the etiology of, of pandemic outbreaks. Um, and uh, at the BioHub, in conjunction with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we developed a software tool to do this analysis. It's called IDSeq. Uh, and uh, my colleague at the Biohub, Joe DeRisi, has used this um, to do a proof of principle uh, in an outbreak of encephalitis in Bangladesh, where uh, our collaborators there drew cerebrospinal spinal fluid from people who either had encephalitis or were suspected of having it, and uh, used sequencing uh, and our tool to identify that uh, uh, a good fraction of these people uh, had a form of encephalitis due to chikungunya virus, which hadn't really been appreciated as a cause of encephalitis, hadn't been appreciated in that part of Bangladesh to be a source of it, and, uh, and really changed the way people are thinking about uh, identifying and treating patients who come in the hospital with that disease. And uh, we are now in the process of getting this tool out to use in many different hospitals uh, to monitor pandemic outbreaks and to see if that result can be uh, reproduced and approved on a large scale. And so, uh, it's something we're quite excited about. We're doing that last part in conjunction with the Gates Foundation. Uh, and again, we're kind of at the beginning of the story, but over the next few years, we hope to, uh, to be able to show that this tool will be a very valuable way to uh, catch outbreaks as they're happening and understand their real uh, uh, sort of specific molecular basis. And with that, I think I'll stop and we can open up for questions uh, to the audience. There's a microphone coming. There's a mic. Oh. Um, a question about the masks that all of us wore this fall. Are they that effective <laughs> against the little particles that you talked about? That's an excellent question. The answer is simple. We don't know. And that's a sad answer, I understand. Uh, there's been only one study 
that's been peer reviewed or published to talk about whether or not these are helpful. Now there are many more studies coming up, so we're going to be doing one as well. Um, but importantly is no one really knows whether it's helpful. We think that it probably is. We know that if you're in a high air polluted area, that if you wear an N95 mask, that that does in general help decrease those PM2.5 uh, particles getting in. But uh, each person has a slightly different face. You need to wear it exactly perfectly to make sure it has a good seal. In addition, unfortunately, even if you wanted to wear a mask, a lot of them weren't available in the wildfire. I don't know if anyone went on Amazon, tried to order them, and they weren't available. So we need to make sure they're more available, that we teach people how to use them effectively. And then also, they're really not available for children under the age of 18. There's no pediatric size mask. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But I agree with you that by wearing one, it's better than doing nothing. And I think having one will help people, especially those people over 65 or under the age of four. But it sounds like it's not 100%. It's nothing's 100%. There is no safe distance from a wildfire, unfortunately, or air pollution. Hi, thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, my question is that what can policy makers or civil servants do in especially countries uh, with limited financial capacities like India? Because I know that uh, even in the capital of India, New Delhi, every year hundreds of people still die of dengue. There are uh, issues regarding high pollution rates. The particle matters are, uh, you know, Hor horrifically high. Uh, so policymakers with less resources, uh, what in your opinion can they do about uh, you know, such massive problems? Um, I can speak uh, as far as under uh, pandemics. Again, like I mentioned, technology, uh, even in the US, we're not going to have necessarily drugs or vaccines to emerging infections, and we're not going to necessarily even have a storage capacity to treat these people in the hospital. Public health control measures are key, and they can be inexpensive. Um, a lot of that has to do with education. Um, a lot of that has to do with teaching people about proper hygiene. A lot of that has to do with, that, with teaching people even to um, avoid perhaps uh, crowded areas during the times of outbreaks. It's uh, actually simple and very low cost things, which I think will have the most uh, effect. I understand there's not much you might be able to do about clean water, but even then, um, one of the actually very easy ways to sterilize water, you can take a, pl a plastic bottle, stick it under sunlight for 24 hours, and actually even that will take out a lot of the uh, pathogens. So there's a, some kind of quick, very low cost things you can do, but a lot of that is basically public health. And to answer your question about pollution and air pollution, New Delhi unfortunately does have some of the highest in the world, um, and we don't see that changing anytime soon. However, uh, there are now movements at the prime minister level to be able to economically uh, try to change that. So wood smoke, for example, people are trying to teach how to change to more economic wood smoke stoves so that, and change the aeration of, the, of a hut or a house so that there's better filtration of the air as well as less exhaust coming from wood smoke. So that's cheap to do, but importantly, it's easy to say, not so easy to do. Hard to change culture and, and what's usually used in the mm -hmm. kitchen, but I think that's a movement. The other item that I think is very helpful is now that we know that diesel exhaust is harmful and that idling buses and idling cars are harmful, for what I understand, the Indian government is actually going to be prohibiting idling, which is fairly cheap and easy to do. And it will perhaps decrease at least some of the diesel exhaust emissions in New Delhi. So these are small things, but importantly, at least it's a movement in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, you're preaching to the choir here. How about dealing with our own government and what, um, 
each of your <coughs> individual organizations, uh, scientific organizations, uh, are doing or can do to try to put pressure on those that need to help make the decisions that we need to make, the hard decisions? Well, I think that one of the most important things that has happened during this period of uh, poor responsiveness from the federal government is California and what we in this state have cumulatively done with our governor and with people from individual cities in this state to understand, acknowledge, and deal with the issues that we're faced with. And I think that California has been very much uh, at the vanguard of what we have to do. Part of it is education. The other part of it is acknowledging that we have, we, there are actual things that we can do to help understand how we can diagnose the problem, go ahead and try to fix the problem. And fortunately, we have private organizations helping with finances to make this happen. And Governor Brown went a very long way in raising our uh, awareness of the problems that we're facing. It is being duplicated in other states across the country, and I hope that it will spread much further. Yeah, I can also add that, uh, you know, I'd say our approach is more to partner and educate. Um, at the Biohub, we work with the CDC and help them out on some of their difficult cases and have a good relationship there as we're starting to move IDSeq out into the developing world. We're partnering with local organizations and ultimately uh, with their government representatives. And, uh, and closer to home in California, we're working with the mosquito abatement districts to right. monitor the vectors there and what's going on. And so by collaborating on a scientific level, we're helping, I think, bring that technology into the kind of government policy-making apparatus. I, th I think it's an excellent question. I think one of the answers is education for us. Uh, for me, I think it's about the next, the education of the uh, next generation. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I've been doing the class uh, for the last 10 years on uh, emerging infectious disease. And also, quite frankly, um, our public health departments are under-resourced. I don't see that changing dramatically except in response to a major crisis like what we have seen in Ebola. And quite frankly, I think a lot of the solutions will have to come from the private sector. So I wouldn't put all my faith in the government as a kind of our savior. I think it's up to us um, to kind of come up with some of the solutions to these issues. And, and I also would say um, that we must stand up to the false news. When the scientific advisory board that was recognizably conflicted, and I was one of the members that was kicked off the board about a year ago, uh, because I was uh, an academic and so and not to be trusted so I was kicked off along with many of my other scientific advisors for the EPA and now uh, basically there's about seven people left but they had this whole meeting where they put into um, uh, basically they questioned whether or not air pollution was associated with health. Now I've given you plenty of examples today where there is a direct linkage between air pollution and health and so it's things like that where I hope that you and we speak up. We can't let those types of things just lie in the news. We have to be a voice and say, no, that's absolutely not true. So things like that, I think that complacency would be inappropriate and that we must speak up and say what the truths are. And in addition, we can give examples that when people have had air pollution mitigated, you see improvements in health. So we already have seen some of the major benefits of changing the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, but then lastly, the economics, just the economics alone, the billions of dollars that are spent in health-related issues that are related to air pollution are immense. And days off from work, days off from school, these things are going to affect the economics of our country if we don't do something about them. China has already seen the repercussions and is making changes right now just for the economic part of the equation. So I'm hoping that our government will stand up if for just the economics alone that we need to do something about climate change.
How about the part of the environment that we're changing? Uh, when I think about you know antibiotic resistance, fungal resistance, uh, and uh, you know many of these things are um, asking people to give up something for the greater good. So in the antibiotic or fungal resistance, you know these are used in agricultural to increase yields. Those people have to agree to take lesser yields in order to have more sustainable kinds of farming. Um, I know in my own case when, uh, you know, I am dead set against overuse of antibiotics until I get the flu or a cold and then I'm all in favor. So that's the dilemma we face is getting people to act for the greater good versus sometimes their own personal benefit. How do you, how do you handle that or think about that? Well, for the first thing, if you have the flu or a cold, do not take antibiotics. <laughs> <laughs> Those are both viral infections, they won't help. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and we struggle with that in the ER all the time. When, um, for example, kids come in with the sniffles, and we think it's very likely that, you know, it's a viral, but, you know, pa parents, for example, really would like the kid to have antibiotics. It's a challenge. I think one of the ways we can approach it is by having better diagnostics. If we can rapidly, and we're on the, on the way there, uh, not quite there, for sure, but we're on the way. Um, if we can rapidly figure out, is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? What kind of bacteria? If we can kind of quickly profile, maybe even the resistance profile, that would be amazing. So that's one approach. Uh, with the agricultural stuff, I mean, you're right. I mean, unfortunately, the, our uh, animals, our chickens are, um, are treated with the same antibiotics that we're treated with. And those plasmids, as you know, they're e easily transfer transferable. Uh, between animals and humans. So I feel like, again, I feel like that's a call we might have to make as a society, how much of antibiotics we use in agriculture, because that's such a big source of antibiotics resistance specifically. Um, and again, uh, as far as providers, we'll just, we just need better diagnostics. I feel like that's uh, really the answer to that. And, and one of the big problems with giving antibiotics to our livestock and our children, chickens, is that what it does is it makes the animals fatter. Mm -hmm. So it's economically bigger bang for buck per creature. And we don't need that for economic reasons alone. Certainly we can use uh, antibiotics to keep our livestock healthy, but not to make them fatter. And much more important is to keep antibiotic resistance to a minimum, and I know you believe that as well. The trouble is, up until the Second World War, the first and most cause of death was infectious disease. After the Second World War, and we had antibiotics, that moved down and was replaced by cancer, by heart disease. We have an uprise in neurological diseases. But now it's coming back. And it's coming back with a vengeance because of resistance to every one of our known antibiotics. So to me, it isn't a, oh gee, do I want to make a lot of money on my farm or do I want to save the lives of my children? I think that we have to have wise, thoughtful analyses, which are hard because you're balancing economics, health, and the future generations. I think, you know, you've got your finger on a really important question of what are the incentives to do things, and it's maybe even more challenging than uh, treating individuals. One of the real unsolved problems is what's the motivation to develop new antibiotics? Um, so, you know, we see this is coming, more resistance is arising. Somebody should be motivated to make a new antibiotic that will, uh, that will uh, uh, work against these resistant bacteria, but if you, a company, invest all the money to do that and they get it approved, that's a very expensive process, mm -hmm. they're going to be told, you have to put that on the shelf. You can't use it because it's our last line of defense. Um, and so they can't get an economic return for the investment. And uh, for that, n nobody's got an answer right now. It's really one of the open questions. And it's an important one of how do you incentivize people to crack that nut. Yeah. And also, in addition to the economic uh, point, uh, with antibiotics, ideally you only use it once. 
So if you're a company trying to maximize your profit, you're, you'd be much better off, given that it takes two and a half billion dollars to develop a drug on average, uh, to develop something like an antihypertensive, which people can use repeatedly, or something um, um, like a diabetes medication on which uh, people can be on for years, rather than do one 10-day course of something. All right, we have a few more. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your perspectives. Um, the purpose of today's talk, I suppose, was more on the adaptation side, but I was curious as to your thoughts on the potential of mitigation and the extent to which our current trajectory might be sufficient to mitigate some of the worst scenarios. Mitigation of, of climate change or of the effects? Climate of climate change itself. Yeah. I hate to say I'm a little cynical on that one myself. You guys have a more optimistic response. <laughs> I, I, I'm optimistic, but with a lot of worries. Um, uh, but I, I do believe that there are countries and examples where, you know, even with mega cities that are, you know, booming in population, that they have taken precautions to try to get a zero emission rate. You know, we have examples like Singapore. There are cities in Brazil and Korea that are doing it right. We have cities in Scandinavia where they have basically taken the center of their city and wrapped it around a perimeter and then everything else is walkable, but every, people are using transport via subway to get there. So I think there are some examples where we can use potentially to do it right. I understand the U.S. is huge, but if we can think about these ways to step forward, I think it's rather than doing nothing, which would be an incredible step backwards, or refuting what we know already to be the case in terms of scientific data. So I think mitigating you know, using, using as much uh, non-fossil fuel type power. We talked about nuclear power earlier today. We talked about other um, ways of thinking about reducing our energy uh, intake. And then I, I think mitigating the effects of climate change, there are going to be repercussions of diesel exhaust combustion already in terms of global warming. But in terms of being able to think ahead of time, predicting where there might be a large amount of pollution in the future and thinking about how the, to we then adapt to that pollution exposure is important. So both mitigation and adaptation is going to be important to discuss. And we do have some examples of those. <coughs> Thanks for this fascinating panel. I'm curious about the role of information technologies in terms of governance in an emerging world and uh, health in the changing environment. In particular, uh, it's a broad idea of a single realistic virtual Earth, thinking Google Street View with time slider maps Earth with TensorFlow for machine learning, with species even at the atomic and cellular levels, and um, for governance, for planning, for research, for education. Um, also maybe to move something like uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technologies into this realistic virtual Earth. To what degree um, would uh, a realistic virtual Earth help in the planning and mitigation and also maybe human adaptation to uh, the significant questions you're asking help? Thanks. So from the perspective of infectious disease, the World Health Organization has a global dashboard where they try to monitor outbreaks. And I think it works by people mailing things in. So it's not exactly real time. And uh, one of our goals of IDSeq is to help make that be not only more of a real time tool, but something where it's tied directly to the molecular information uh, of any outbreak, where the, you know, the DNA sequences are directly tied in and people can track how the strains move and things like that. And so uh, that's going to come. It's just a question of when, not if, I think. Um, you know, more generally, uh, uh, I think, you know, you're going to see the use of physiological monitoring tools, the Fitbits, the Apple Watches, and all that sort of tied into uh, monitoring people's health. That's who's, you know, in uh, poor health due to a heat wave, and who's getting dehydrated and overheated and things like that, where that will be tied into not only to caregivers, but uh, family members and things like that. And uh, because the people who tend to be most vulnerable in heat waves are the elderly and the very young who often don't notice. And so I think that's another place where you'll see this sort of network technology uh, adding a lot to human health. 
As far as uh, surveillance um, efforts in regards to, for example, pandemics, infectious disease, um, your data is only as good as the data you're inputting. And that is the hard part. How do you monitor an outbreak of cholera in a refugee camp where they, they barely, they don't even maybe have access to clean water? I mean, we're talking about the basics here. How do you uh, report an outbreak in some remote villages, um, you know, in Asia or in Africa? Um, that is hard. Um, of course, there's, there's been for decades, in fact, a movement. People want really good situational awareness and they want uh, kind of one size fits all solution. The truth is right now it's very much a patchwork. There are a number of organizations, including the WHO, that work on gathering this data, but this data is far from perfect. There's about a, a month and a half delay, uh, for example, with the WHO from the uh, first incident case to the time the outbreak is reported in their outbreak news. That's a month and a half. That's no virtual world, okay? So I think the, the fundamental problem that we're facing, which cuts across almost everything that we've discussed today, is that the solutions to these problems have to be global. There is no isolated place. Everything we do to mitigate, to prevent, to diagnose, has to be worldwide. There are no islands. Therefore, we have to have information up in the cloud immediately from places not only in England, not only in Malaysia, not only in Uganda, but everywhere. And we need a network of not a virtual world, but a real world. And that means we need cooperation, we need political communication, and we need the support of the public. And the support of the public is only going to come from education and not listening to things that are nonsense. So I think we have an enormous problem, but we do have the technology to ultimately make this work. Thank you. One of the important themes, obviously, is education and public health. There was, about 10 years ago, an effort at so-called academic detailing to deal with doctors being bombarded by promotional issues from drug companies. And the academic part was to counter the false news, to counter <laughs> the misuse of facts, and to reinstate a kind of respect for science. It obviously is not one size fits all, but could we not call for one of the pillars in the future to be sort of different sizes of academic detailing, one for the public at large, one for policymakers, one for health professionals, in the sense that they need to have the facts they need in order to do a good job? Your thoughts? I'd love to return to a fact-based world. <laughs> <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> there's a number of uh, agencies which are public agencies, one of them being the Center for Disease Control, uh, which is responsible with a lot of the dissemination of accurate information, and they have um, um, information that's targeted f towards providers like physicians and then they have information targeted towards uh, lay public with maybe less medical knowledge and maybe it's a bit harder to get information across to, to the higher echelons of power you know the Senate and such you know that might take lobbying informational sessions of other kinds um, but it's uh, absolutely critical but you know average person is not going to go to the CDC website to look up their data average person is going to read it up on you know some fake news or in the internet and that's uh, one of the troubles um, as far as what you mentioned with the drug companies I know that's been an issue there is a huge movement away from that at least in academia I don't really know how that happens in the public sector but I can't you know we don't really see them at least you know in my department we don't um, but it's a absolutely mass. It's also where people get their data, where people get their information. Um, and it's the onus is somewhat on us to try to educate them as academics, but we're, they don't automatically go to our website or our news. So we have to be a little bit more proactive and a little bit more with the program of how things, news actually get uh, spread. 
That's a great question. Hey. Um, one question that I had was that's like targeting like the um, climate change perspective and as well as the pandemics. One of the underlying problems is population growth. Um, like we are seeing um, that we need many more resources and we are like, um, as you said, like technology can be one solution like tackling these issues, but with an increasing population, how do we, what are the kind of possibilities that we actually have on um, like making progress on these issues. Don't worry, the next pandemic is going to solve that problem. Exactly. <laughs> It'll be less. <laughs> um, <coughs> so your question is around, I want to make sure I, we answer your question. So your question is around how do we uh, plan for the increased population growth uh, as far as these issues? The question is, um, what kind of approaches do you think can we take in order to limit population growth so oh. we um, are better in controlling, for example, the effects on climate change or like uh, the outbreaks of pandemics? Yeah, well, that's a, uh, you can speak to that. That's a very complicated question. Anything that has to do with education to availability of birth control to uh, a whole uh, range of factors. That's as far as controlling the population growth. Um, but there's also a lot of things that we can do, again, as, around not just public health by messages, by communication, but also about uh, technological advancement as far as enabling social distancing. As humans, we've traditionally, we've evolved in bands, right? As uh, sapiens, we are adapted to living in bands of like 10, 100 to 150. We're not used to, we're not really adapted, built to live in this global village, so it's absolutely um, a valid point. And uh, we're going to travel a lot more. So I think, again, education, and um, I don't know what, what can we really do. Well, it turns out that over the next 50 to 100 years, uh, we're not going to have population growth anywhere in the world except for Africa. And everyone else is kind of topping out. The places that have had massive growth over the last century, China and India, they're flattening out and they're going to turn around. And so the real question is, uh, how is Africa going to handle its population growth? Because that's what's going to be driving uh, the world's population growth, and it's a really good question. Um, I mean, there there are, are many aspects to it having to do with infrastructure and how you support a population, how you uh, help everyone enjoy a good quality of life, and it's going to be really interesting to see. I think it goes well beyond uh, the topic at hand, for sure. So thank you all for highlighting um, potential solutions to these, this very complex topic. I think that's very important to rally people and give them a sense of optimism looking forward. Um, we talked about the role of innovation, and that could include very simple forms of innovation or new forms of science, uh, and, and all are important. My question is, since we're sitting in one of the world's innovation capitals, how do we get the broader Stanford and Bay Area communities really fired up around this notion of bringing innovation to address health and the changing environment. Um, this could be new technologies, new business models, new ways of thinking about philanthropy. I mean, how do we really get this engine sort of accelerating? Well, you know, I think that one of the best examples of that is the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. <clears throat> and this is based on philanthropy from the Zuckerbergs, and has actually resulted in a new paradigm of doing uh, very basic research in a free, unfettered way so that we don't have to prove that we know the answer before we can get funds to do it, uh, and to then approach problems that are both curiosity-driven research but have an outcome that we talk about and think about, and that is the health of our population. And Steve can speak more to that. He is the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, but, and I'm very honored to be part of this, and I find it quite remarkable. So, and what that's done is brought together three campuses in the Bay Area, Berkeley, UCSF, and Stanford, in a way that they have never worked together before. And the results are tremendously exciting. So what you're 
proposing is in fact happening. Yes, and I'll just add a little bit to that by saying it, it is definitely an attempt explicitly to harness the creativity of the Bay Area and sort of what makes this such a special place for innovation. Um, it's got three great universities, two great medical schools, two great engineering schools, three great, uh, three great basic science schools among the three universities, Stanford, UCSF, and Berkeley. And uh, the universities uh, were willing to take a risk themselves and be part of something that they'd never done before and let it be sort of independent and yet bring everyone together. We're funding the research of 100 faculty members from the three universities to work on their riskiest, most exciting ideas. Uh, we get them together twice a month uh, and people share their work and their ideas and uh, uh, are able to talk across disciplines and across their respective campuses and it's leading to many new collaborations. Um, we're early in the experiment, we're only two and a half years into what's going to be a 10 year experiment, um, but the early results have us all very excited. Um, we also have 95 employees at the Biohub who are mostly scientists and engineers and are working on technologies and large projects that would be difficult to do in universities. And again, very exciting early results and uh, we'll see where it takes us. Well, one of the exciting talks we heard just last week was about the mosquito virome, taking mosquitoes and mashing them up and isolating the DNA and separating out the viral genomes from away from the mosquito genome so we could then track in surveillance what's happening all over the state, which viruses are being carried by which mosquitoes. And this is being done today, now. And it's, I think, absolutely amazing. I, I think your question is a good one. Technology has a lot of a uh, majority of the time been developed uh, through some innovation, a lot of it here at Stanford. Uh, but importantly is, you know, through philanthropy you're seeing that that allows us to take risks where government funding doesn't necessarily allow us to. And so with that you're already seeing if you use digital health, if you use any kind of exposure unit in your home, either an air filter, a lot of things were developed here at Stanford, but we can do even better. And I think there are a lot of investigators here that want to. We have an incredible group of engineers that are working on better air filter systems as well as better ways to, ex uh, to look at personal exposure with exposure Fitbits, for example. All that's happening. There are at least five companies that have started here in the last two years from Stanford out in the Bay Area, but we can do better. And so I think with that, we're looking to get help from philanthropy, get help from resources and ideas from people like these types of audiences where we can be part of that collective to improve uh, because we need to improve from where we are. We've seen the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative do incredible, but there are diseases that still need to be looked at, prevented, cured, and global climate change is going to affect those diseases. So we need to be ahead of the technology. Thank you for all the uh, great discussion in insights, technology, solution, and hope. And um, my question is how can people access, understand, and react to such information? And before answering that, I want to add a little bit of thoughts before. And the first aspect is uh, we are talking about accessing the information. How can we, like, it's related to the capitalism. Like, how can people be released from the economic pressure of the attention? And can we, like, uh, uh, remove the information barrier, instru instru instrumental barrier to really, like, f have a free market? And the second part, like, understanding, which is talking about education. Like, can the education be more adaptive? Like, can people, can we know people how much information they know and how, like, how to present them the right information at the need? Can it be adaptive, uh, interactive, and informative? And the third part, how, how do people react to the uh, information, which is democracy? Like, um, we are talking about, like, people have, uh, so, so we should be honest that we are fundamentally, like, biologically limited. Our cognitive back bandwidth is limited, and our like cognitive ability to decide is limited to our knowledge base. So, 
can we also address that issues to make a like collaborative society? So, which means like, can we include more people, like the mass people, to to include improve their cognitive ability to be able to involve in the like uh, bigger issues? Can we be more open to share the resources, to uh, the knowledge, the IPs? Can we empower people with UBI or with adaptive learning to really release the personal productivity? So overall, how open are we? How open are we in bringing the mass, uh, the ideas, solutions from the young generation, the mass and uh, general public? Thank you. Yeah, I can say a little bit about that. Um, you know, as scientists, we publish all our research in the open literature, and we'd like everyone to have access to it. Um, uh, and sometimes you need a journal subscription or a library that has the journals to read that. And that's been sort of an, the state of the affairs for the last hundred years. Um, now technology is driving new ways to share information. And one of the experiments we've been doing at the Biohub is to have everyone we fund and all of our scientists share their research on a preprint server before it's published. So that lets the information get out there without the need to be in a library. Um, and you don't need access to a library. Anybody can read our papers or access our data. Um, and it also accelerates the dissemination of the information. So it usually takes between 12 to 18 months to get something published through peer review. And by sharing as a preprint, uh, people can see it immediately when you submit it. Um, we're hoping that will accelerate science. Again, it's sort of an experiment. We're going to monitor it over time and see if we can draw any conclusions. But that's our take on it. Okay. George says sayonara. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Yes, thank you so much for coming. It's been a wonderful time with you.